Good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that today we're gathering on the traditional ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I am grateful for their stewardship of these lands and their continued hospitality. Vancouver Police Department officers no longer confiscate drugs weighing less than 2.5 grams in circumstances covered by the decriminalization exemption. In the nine months following the implementation of the exemption, which began on January 31st, 2023, our officers had 100% compliance with the terms of the exemption. In that same period, total drug possession seizures in Vancouver dropped by 76% compared to the previous four-year average. Before decriminalization came into effect, our officers rarely made criminal charge or rarely made arrests or recommended criminal charges against persons found with small amounts of illegal substances unless aggravating factors were present. We appreciate that there were still circumstances when VPD officers were required under law to seize and destroy small amounts of drugs. We recognized that this often led to unintended harms for people who use drugs. As such, we supported the Health Canada exemption and its provisions for people who possess small amounts of illicit drugs to keep their substances. I am aware of reports claiming that VPD drug seizures have actually increased since decriminalization took effect. Let me be clear, such reports are patently false and are wholly incorrect. These claims are based on data that was obtained via an information, our Freedom of Information request. Drug seizure data was released for a one-year period surrounding the implementation of the exemption. Specifically, the six-month period before and the six-month period after January 31st, 2023. The drug seizure data was contained on a spreadsheet with just under 3,200 rows of data. Importantly, Along with the spreadsheet, the Vancouver Police Department provided a covering memorandum that explicitly highlighted nine different limitations of the drug seizure data. One of the key limitations listed was, and I quote, the total quantity held by the individual is not reflected in this data set as each packaged item is recorded on a separate line, end quote. In brief, a row on the spreadsheet corresponds to a physical item, but many items are typically from the same seizure. In reality, the average seizure involved more than six different items or rows in the spreadsheet. Review of VPD data confirmed that all seizures following decriminalization coming into effect were fully compliant with the Health Canada exemption. In fact, the average weight of drugs seized in each incident was more than 80 grams. This is an amount that is more than 30 times the 2.5 gram threshold. Claims that VPD officers are seizing more drugs at or below the 2.5 gram threshold are clearly false. Yep. Such conclusions are the result of recklessly ignoring clear warnings that accompanied the data. A main goal of decriminalization is to break down real or perceived barriers between the police and people who use drugs. We heard from people who use drugs and community organizations that a consistent application of the decriminalization exemption was a key desired outcome. The data clearly shows that our officers are committed to supporting the implementation of decriminalization and its overarching goal to take a health-led approach to substance use as opposed to a criminal justice one. Reversing the deadly harms of the ongoing drug toxicity crisis takes a willingness to change historical practices and approaches to substance use. We are committed to working with health, government, and community partners to achieve better public safety and health outcomes in the community we proudly serve. We continue to work collaboratively to break down barriers in support of taking a health-led approach to substance use. Our data shows that our officers have fully complied with the decriminalization exemption. I believe that this result is a testament to their commitment, compassion, and professionalism. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions you may have.
Factor her the nine months. Which period was that? Uh, so there is last uh, year a year. No, so Feb uh, February first through the end of October. Why why only that? And why public year? Oh, we've continued to re continually reassess the data. Uh, that was the nine-month period that has been um, reported on to our partners, both at government, Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction, other policing partners, in terms of studying the decriminalization and its implementation. But we're committed to ongoing assessments and review of all of our data. But just so I'm clear, if someone breaks into a car in Tibet, um and you arrest that person, and they have uh, 2.5 or, or less on them, what do you do with that? It, it becomes part of your property. And even, you know, depending on the circumstances, you, you know, the officers, if they're going to recommend a charge, they might release you at the scene with paperwork where you promise to appear before the courts. Uh, in the case that you aren't suitable for release and end up in our jail, you still keep your substances. It ends up in your effects. Uh, obviously, you know, in custody, you aren't able to access things like your cell phone, a knife, but drugs become simply under the threshold, become property, just like your cell phone or any other thing. You wouldn't have access to it while in custody, but it remains your property. And upon your re your release from jail, it would be returned to you. And just so I'm fair, I think that the uh, figure you have 70 seventy six percent of all drug seizures, like a decrease. So that's over and above two point five. Yes. So those are all drug seizures, specifically, you know, including ones that are not covered by the exemption. So what that shows to me, it's a great question, uh, is that officers are still exercising their discretion. And you'll see in some of the infographics we put out, there's specific focus on uh, potential seizures just above the threshold, specifically two and a half to four and a half grams. So these are things that wouldn't be covered by the exemption, but obviously officers have discretion in all these circumstances. Uh, and so we expect that officers will exercise discretion in such cases. And we have seen a significant decrease there, but obviously discretion is inversely correlated to the amount present. Obviously when you get to higher levels, 100 grams, half kilogram a kilogram, we wouldn't expect uh, discretion in, in higher order cases. So what if you do with 76% drop, did that free up resources to focus on other things? Great question. I mean, I think historically, you know, there is a small time savings. I think historically, uh, people often overemphasize or overpredict the amount of uh, officer time that was spent investigating simple drug possession. Before decriminalization came into effect, we typically only had about five charges recommended per year. Uh, and they were typically very special circumstances. You know, your sexual offender, that's part of their offending cycle is substance use, a repeat violent offender whose offending cycle is, is surrounding uh, substance use. So, you know, the reduction of those cases is small. Is there some, you know, efficiency? Absolutely, but I think it's often, you know, overstated. Have you seen what's happening in Oregon and, and what does the BPD think about them choosing to reverse things? You know, we definitely look at uh, drug policies throughout the world. Definitely, you know, Oregon's one that gets uh, a lot of headlines as well as Portugal. So we're always mindful of experiences in other jurisdictions and, and what's going on, trying to study what works. Uh, it has also some challenges. So, you know, definitely have, have reached out to partners in Oregon uh, to try to understand their experience with decrim. They obviously went live with their measure 110 uh, almost two years before Vancouver, or British Columbia did. Uh, so we're committed to, you know, whether it's Oregon, Portugal, Norway, looking at, you know, drug policy throughout the world. Have you identified some of the key differences on, on why we grew up better here? Um, I think, I think definitely here, theirs obviously was brought in um, by a referendum, measure 110, which was a public referendum. Um, I think here, obviously the topic can become political, uh, but in the decriminalization, discussions that I've seen here. I think it was a much more pragmatic health-led approach, whether it was, you know, government partners, police, health, um, trying to trying to keep potentially politics or opinions or bias out of the out of the equation. I think the ongoing crisis is so serious. I think the public um, as organizations in charge in, in terms of working with the government, representing the public, I think people expect us to take a very evidence-based pragmatic approach as opposed to something that's political or, or opinion-based. You mentioned the public, let's bring it back if we can, because you remember that you were against this, a lot of people were against this, so people supported it. But in your opinion, we're going to go repetition here, but your opinion, how has it worked out? Could you say she overall has it been a good being successful? I think it's, I think it's been a successful thing. I think there was a lot of concern in terms of, you know, how would this change? It definitely seemed, I think, to a lot of people 
that were involved in policing, potentially that this was a major change um, and this was a significant departure. We know for us, for our officers, we weren't recommending charges. We weren't typically seizing substances. So really this wasn't uh, a massive shift. There was already overarching changes that are occurring federally. Um, you know, the charging guidelines for actually laying charges by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada have changed. Officers are required to consider means short of charging people. Uh, as well, there's legal reform in terms of the laws that came into effect where basically, you know, other measures, including health diversion, is now part of the law. And so I think, you know, it's for people that aren't familiar with the drug laws, it probably seems like a wholesale change, but I think it was a much smaller change than people perhaps realized. Always challenges with changes. What were the challenges? I think definitely, you know, things around public use, complaints from, you know, community, from businesses, you know, absolutely not going to say for a second that we haven't heard complaints, we haven't had challenges. Uh, and I think in all these things, all the partners are committed to trying to get things right and trying to balance the needs of people who use drugs, you know, the, the horrible toxicity that exists with the drug supply, but also meeting the needs of all of the community that we serve. You mentioned complaints. What do you mean by the complaints? Uh, just, just calls. Just in terms of calls of people saying that, you know, there's someone openly using or consuming drugs. I don't think for a second most people that use drugs want to use in front of children or want to use in a manner that disturbs somebody else. But like everything in our society are the actions of some individuals, sometimes a source of a complaint for another person in society. Absolutely. What do you think are the concerns people have that someone can say, use drugs on a beach, they can't open a drink uh, in certain areas, that's a crime, yet yeah, using hard drugs is not. What do you say to people who pose that odd? I, I get that. I mean, in terms of it being like a very simplistic argument, uh, at the same time, you know, as someone who likes to to probably, you know, have a drink himself, I, I get that, you know, the logic of that that argument for the average person in our society. But I think we have to be respectful of the danger and the risk that is posed by the opioid crisis. It's it's hard to overstate and it's hard really for, for a lot of people to, you know, wrap their head around. It's the leading cause of death for everyone in BC from age 10 to 59. It's, you know, when we look at things like homicides, suicides, car accidents, all those things combined, our drugs are twice as likely to kill people. So, you know, I think, you know, does the logic potentially just on its face as you expressed look like it's somehow non-congruent? I can appreciate that, but I think, you know, we have to recognize the harms and the need for change given the risk that's out there with the opioid crisis. And so I think, you know, it does deserve special consideration. For the procedures that, that were made in this in Simon Optic period, right? Um, you know, how how many arrests were involved during that period? And like, who were the people, um, have you, how would you describe the people that were having those drug seeds, right? Like, were they bona fide, like traffickers that were working in an organized way? Were they people that just used use drugs for their for their own needs, right? Like, who were they? I would have to get back to you with specifically on some of those questions, but what I can say is, you know, even before decriminalization, but even more so now that it's in effect, our enforcement efforts are really focused on those people doing the most harm, the people importing, manufacturing, high-level trafficking. You know, I think it's a, oftentimes people appreciate, they look at decrim and they think, is this going soft on drugs? Is this a soft approach? Is this, you know, left versus right? And it's an oversimplification. Really what we see in our society is there's a big distinction between people that are looking to profit from making drugs, traffic drugs, all the violence that associates organized crime. That is a huge danger to our society, but you can still have compassion for those that are at the most risk. Those that are the most vulnerable in our society, people who use drugs. And so I think being compassionate, but also targeting organized crime aren't inconsistent at all, but it's definitely, you know, oftentimes we oversimplify things and think, you know, is this going soft on drugs or is this, you know, taking an approach that legalizes other things like trafficking that we don't want to see? And it's not. For those who, um, you know, for those doing the most serious kind of trafficking then, right? Um, since their resources were extensively pulled away, I mean, those um, who've, uh, who've had smaller amounts of drugs, like how much more effective did the police get? in tackling uh, those two more serious traps. I think it ties into the earlier comment. I think it's definitely, you know, oftentimes it's overstated how much work was being done uh, investigating simple possession. It is an efficiency, uh, but I think it's a relatively small one. Does the BBD support a prescribed safer supply? 
Yes, so currently we've come out uh, publicly in one of our previous, I can get you a copy of it, uh, our previous uh, uh, papers on our response to the overdose crisis. And we were actually one of the first police agencies in North America to come out in support of prescribed safe supply. In terms of the impact on people who use drugs, some advocates have been saying like uh, some of the larger quantities above 2.5 might be you know, multi-day supply so people can kind of go about their business and not have to keep going back to their dealer or what have you. Uh, the VPD, it's been reported, advocated for a smaller threshold of, of drugs for the personal supply exemption. What's the stance now on where that limit is? Like we talk about targeting the higher, like the worst of the worst, the higher level offenders. Is 2.5 still, from what you're seeing, kind of the appropriate threshold? I, I think so. Um, I, you know, I was part of some of those conversations where definitely people brought up circumstances in terms of rural communities, work camps, where logically you could see people looking to buy uh, a higher volume. And it's not that in creating the policy there was an appetite to exclude or disenfranchise some people. Uh, it's making a public policy and it's trying to make it for a broad base and cover the entire uh, population. So, you know, much like things with speed limits, are there people that probably realistically could drive, you know, faster than I could drive safely? There probably are people that are, you know, experienced professional drivers. Uh, but that said, you still need to make a speed limit that fits for all of society. And so a lot of those considerations went into it. Um, I do think 2.5 uh, grams as a threshold, it became, you know, arguably one of the biggest items and aspects of decriminalization that was discussed. Uh, thankfully, in decriminalization coming into effect, I don't think it's, you know, turn, it's still discussed and those conversations are fair. Uh, I would like to see a data-led approach. I know a lot of the work that was done, even in Vancouver, amongst, you know, groups that represent people who, who use drugs, found that most of their members were actually buying at the half gram level. So basically one-fifth of what the threshold was. So open-minded in terms of further research, uh, and that's something we've committed to in terms of the three-year pilot project, looking at all aspects of the exemption uh, and ensuring that you know they serve the public as best as possible. And obviously, this issue has become highly politicized, in, especially you know basically since it began. So you know, there's these uh, depictions of Vancouver as kind of being more unsafe, and this is part of what's making it unsafe. In terms of a public safety concern, how big or how high up does personal possession rank for you? I don't think it's fair to equate, you know, concerns about safety with personal drug use. I mean, anyone that has experience with people who use drugs, especially, you know, full-blown substance use disorder, people are not going to use or not use because of the threat of a personal possession charge. That is not driving people's behavior. It's not driving the substance use disorder that they're struggling with. Uh, and so to say now that, you know, decriminalization is playing into that, I think is, is not accurate in terms of reality. In terms of, you know, you're saying that it's basically like these small seizures down 100%. They're not happening anymore. Uh, how it would be very easy for, say, someone kind of conspiracy minded or to just ask the question, how do you know that? And, uh, you know, it would be very easy to just say, bitch them down a sewer or something like that and, uh, and stop or whatever. No, fair question. We're fully transparent around our data or even, you know, circumstances that you describe would be something that would be covered by our professional code of conduct, by our police act. Um, I know that we've had no complaints from the public in terms of any kind of professional misconduct or officers not complying with the exemption. So absolutely, you know, we have a, a you know, host of oversight uh, rec uh, regimes in place to make sure that our officers comply with the law uh, in, their, in their conduct. So, you know, uh, you know, fully transparent and accountable, whether it's around the data, whether it's around our officers' actions in a given situation. Just to clarify around public complaints, have you seen an increase in public complaints? And can you draw a straight line between decriminalization and an increase in public drug use? And how do you how do you measure increase in public drug use uh, in that? No, great question. We have looked at our data. We're mindful of complaints that come in from the public, and we haven't seen an increase. We've actually seen a decrease in, in public complaints around um, public consumption. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you know circumstances don't arise where you know people rightfully have concerns around public drug use. And we're still responsive to that. But in terms of strictly, you know, have the numbers gone up? They have not. Right. And what's the conversation like uh, with uh, with an officer and somebody who uses drugs? I understand there was supposed to be a, was sort of a few information shoot or something that was passed on. That's, are VPD officers doing that? Maybe you can yep. just elaborate on what is on that sheet. Yep. So they, absolutely. So there was, uh, as part of the exemption, uh, in terms of ensuring that there's actual off ramps, pathways to health care. Uh, there are uh, provincially approved uh, cards that are resource cards that get people information 
phone numbers, websites they can visit in terms of community-based healthcare. Uh, and those are given out by our officers when uh, upon their discretion. We're not going to, we don't ever want, we respect that we don't want to be, you know, forcing healthcare on people. That was definitely something we heard uh, from community, from people who use drugs. Uh, so like anything, if we deal with an individual and they ask our officers about uh, where they can get a meal, where the nearest shelter is, absolutely, we'll supply that information. Same thing with decriminalization in terms of the health cards. If, if people are looking for community-based support, we're happy to provide them the card and, and refer them. An overdose prevention uh, site on Seymour Street, uh, the lease is supposed to expire at the end of this month. Uh, Vancouver Coastal Health has not said publicly if it's found a replacement site. Uh, there's some data showing that uh, aside from the downtown, you side the fire department has attended the most overdose calls in that neighborhood. Uh, does the VPD have a position on um, whether there should be more uh, overdose prevention sites in that neighborhood? You know, I, I don't. Uh, I don't have any information specifically on that overdose prevention site. I can say, in terms of overdoses, we actually stopped attending overdose calls back in 2006. We we're the first Canadian uh, police agency to do so. We typically only attend about two to three overdoses a week, and that's only when paramedics or fire uh, professionals, based on the information that they're given, call for police to attend. So your circumstances where someone was potentially, you know, violent before becoming unconscious, or there's bystanders or a crowd that's causing a a potential safety issue for first responders will attend. So, you know, in terms of overdose response, I would definitely, you know, defer to to fire and, and paramedics in terms of what they're seeing. Um, but, you know, in terms of overdose prevention sites broadly, we obviously support them. I think there's 12 currently, as well as a mobile 13th uh, overdose prevention site in the city of Vancouver. Uh, you know, very topical. Last week, the Auditor General of BC's report came out uh, on overdose prevention sites uh, it was one of the aspects it covered and discussed the need to have those services accessible to people throughout BC. So, you know, as police, we support that. Uh, just last month, a couple of uh, city councillors on the business license review panel rejected a staff recommendation to uh, reject um, business license for a mushroom dispensary just up the street here. So they're allowed to continue operating and they have operated. This was one of the uh, Dispensaries that the VPD rated, is there any connection between decriminalization and, and what happened there? Well, I think, you know, it raises a couple of, of very good points. With decriminalization, it specifically covers four substances. Opioids, methamphetamine, cocaine, and MDMA, or ecstasy. Uh, it doesn't cover hallucinogens. In addition, the decriminalization exemption is around personal possession. So trafficking of any substance in any amount remains illegal. Uh, and so I think a lot of times, you know, are there people or uh, is there an intention sometimes for people to try to make the exemption um, confusing or gray? Absolutely, for their own purposes. Uh, but the exemption is very clear. Can you update us? Are there going to be any charges against? I don't have an update on that file. Okay. Well, from over sorry, granular question, Ed, you know, when it comes to the, the data you get on each day on, on seizures dropping, I mean, what was sort of statistical significance of comparing it to a four-year Right. So in terms of, um, we have the infographics available uh, linked into our uh, release. But in terms of, you know, at or below 2.5 grams, 100% reduction. Uh, specifically in the 2.5 to 4.5 gram range, which is, I think, something that became very topical in terms of the implementation of decriminalization. Would there be a shift potentially uh, to these areas? Or would officers be exercising discretion there? We've seen an 84% reduction. Uh, and lastly, in terms of, you know, seizures at any weight, a 76% reduction. So again, to my earlier comment, what you're seeing there is as the weights increase, naturally, you're going to see less discretion when you deal with higher volumes, higher weights. So the data that was released under the FOI and then uh, point to BPD is actually doing this, is this in direct response to what you say is being misrepresented perhaps publicly? That's the message we want to get out. I mean, to me, the overdose crisis is much too serious to make inaccurate or misleading statements about. Uh, it's something that I think, you know, the public expects us to be fully transparent and impartial about and following the evidence in terms of how the uh, exemption is being implemented. And, you know, it's definitely, to me, reprehensible to see people suggesting that officers are seizing more drugs and telling that to the public, including people who use drugs, well, that's completely untrue. It's not a little bit off. It's 
100% off. Before the election, we also heard that, you know, uh, public violence was, was skyrocketing and only, you know, only the right political candidate could save us all from it. And that came out that, that those, those crimes were actually decreasing too in the lead up to that. So like, if we're to uh, kind of look at this data and say, okay, well, it's actually going down. I'm like, how are we supposed to, to, to believe anything where it's like a, a new stat can be pointed to, uh, to suit anyone's purposes, whether it's claiming there's chaos and crime, no. you know, a catastrophe looming on the horizon. No, I think it's a matter, you know, gr good question. I think it's a matter of integrity, like under our oath of office for any of our police officers, myself included, we took an oath, you know, to faithfully honestly and impartially serve and to perform our duties. And I think that's what's required here in terms of decriminalization is to be you know, respectful of the magnitude of the problem, approach it with great deference and be transparent about what the data actually shows given the severity of the problem. Um, you know, and we're committed to doing that. I know you got a text here from someone who works for the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. You've probably answered one of these questions. They they ask, uh, how do they decide seize? How do they track less formal interactions? Where all your seizures reported? How do they determine what is considered a possession from the purpose of trafficking? Has there been a switch for seizing small amounts under a uh, possession of the purpose of trafficking? So does that make so? I think you've answered some of that as well. I think so. And I, I mean, to the point of, you know, this concern about, um, you know, our officers now going to focus more on trafficking, it is definitely a metric we're watching in terms of the, the number of trafficking cases. And essentially what we've seen is no change before or after decriminalization, which is what we want because decriminalization, as we discussed, did not does not cover trafficking. At the same time, we're mindful we don't want to see a potential increase uh, in small trafficking investigations. And so we're, we watch our monthly uh, trafficking investigation numbers. And what we've seen is that they're completely consistent before and after decriminalization, which I think is a good outcome. Have you tried to get corrections or verifications or even in touch with the researchers who published that uh, that article online? Because I think we're, we're all talking about, we're all thinking about the same one here. So have you been in touch with them or have they responded to you? Absolutely. No, I uh, haven't reached out. You know, I definitely read the article. Uh, and I think, you know, in the article, everyone is free to read it. I think, you know, the, the, the individuals clearly state in there that they understood that there was um, warnings provided with the data. And the approach was that, those flaws in the data must have existed before and after decrim. Therefore, you know, their analysis was going to go ahead and it's completely flawed. It's completely flawed. If you, if you see in the spreadsheet, if you see, you know, two grams, two grams, you, you see two grams five times in a row, you can't tell if that's potentially in the extreme. Is this five cases of the exemption not being followed? Or is this an individual that has five different amounts of two grams and the exemption doesn't apply and it's a legal seizure? So, uh, it's definitely, you know, reckless just to take the data, analyze it, and, you know, come to misleading conclusions. I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, you know, as, as a journalist, like, we take, uh, you know, requests for clarification and corrections pretty seriously, generally speaking. Um, why not go that route? There's, it, cause it seems like there's just kind of this one group of, or two pair of researchers who put that out there. I will say, like, my concern is more that not only with, you know, an individual article, but more that uh, we saw in the last few weeks more references to, you know, it has been reported, analysis has shown, um, you know, that kind of language creeping into other reputable uh, reports. And so we just want to come out on the record and be clear about what the data actually does show uh, and what is happening. The seizures that happened, right, maybe you can just kind of reiterate, like the average number of, because uh, I know in that data that was, you can't really distinguish it, like every single line that was associated with one person. Yep. <laughs> This would in arrests either, right? Um, maybe you could just describe like the again like the average uh, grams. Okay. So the average so the average seizure was eighty grams, over eighty grams. So you know, in terms of these discussions about you know, is it the police shifting or is it the police, you know, now looking at two and a half to four and a half grams? Absolutely not. What we're talking about here is eighty grams, thirty times what the threshold is. So you know, these are clearly cir uh, circumstances that are much larger in scale. I think it's up one more in. That's I'll just sorry, guys, just from what Daryl was saying earlier. Um, we talked about the dangerous drugs. No. Is there any data anywhere that suggests things are well? 
better or worse since this? Uh, I, I think that to me, the, the, like one of, we work with all of our partners. We'd look at drug checking data, whether it's from overdose prevention sites, community-based groups. Uh, for me, always one of the most compelling data sources, the BC Coroner Service uh, and their dashboard that they put out monthly statistics on, you know, in terms of, you know, the things that we look at, what percentages of deaths involved what drugs. That has remained relatively constant. It's usually about 85 to 86 percent uh, of fentanyl being found in overdose deaths. The, the actual toxicity or potency of the fentanyl, uh, these are all things that we're looking at. And to your point, really, we haven't seen any uh, statistical changes in, in those variables since decriminalization took effect. All right. Thank you. Yes.